You're listening to Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in Season 3 of Weekend Reads, we will be making our way through the 1922 abridgment of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. You can visit MidwestCovencast.com to find podcast extras, including a free online copy of the text. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on Patreon for access to additional materials, like a serialized official Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads ebook with additional notes about the text and some editorial modernizations straight from, well, me. Now, Coven, it is time to cozy up with your coffee or tea and enjoy this episode of Weekend Reads. Chapter 56 The Public Expulsion of Evils. Subsection 1 the omnipresence of demons. In the foregoing chapter, the primitive principle of the transference of ills to another person, animal, or thing was explained and illustrated, but similar means have been adopted to free a whole community from diverse evils that afflict it. Such attempts to dismiss at once the accumulated sorrows of a people are by no means rare or exceptional. On the contrary, they have been made in many lands, and from being occasional, they tend to become periodic and annual. It needs some effort on our part to realize the frame of mind which prompts these attempts, bred in a philosophy which strips nature of personality and reduces it to the unknown cause of an orderly series of impressions on our senses. We find it hard to put ourselves in the place of the savage, to whom the same impressions appear in the guise of spirits or the handiwork of spirits. For ages, the army of spirits, once so near, has been receding farther and farther from us, banished by the magic wand of science from hearth and home, from ruined cell and ivied tower, from haunted glade and lonely mere, from the riven murky cloud that belches forth the lightning, and from those fairer clouds that pillow the silvery moon or fret the flakes of burning red the golden eye. The spirits are gone, even from their last stronghold in the sky, whose blue arch no longer passes, except with children, for the screen that hides from mortal eyes, the glories of the celestial world. Only in poets' dreams or impassioned flights of oratory is it given to catch a glimpse of the last flutter of the standards of the retreating host, to hear the beat of their invisible wings, the sound of their mocking laughter, or the swell of angel music dying away in the distance. Far otherwise is it with the savage. To his imagination, the world still teems with those motley beings whom a more sober philosophy has discarded. Fairies and goblins, ghosts and demons still hover about him, both waking and sleeping. They dog his footsteps, dazzle his senses, enter into him, harass and deceive and torment him in a thousand freakish and mischievous ways. The mishaps that befall him, the losses he sustains, the pains he has to endure, he commonly sets down, if not to the magic of his enemies, to the spite or anger or caprice of the spirits. Their constant presence wearies him, their sleepless malignity exasperates him. He longs with an unspeakable longing to be rid of them altogether, and from time to time, driven to bay, his patience utterly exhausted, he turns fiercely on his persecutors and makes a desperate effort to chase the whole pack of them from the land, to clear the air of their swarming multitudes, that he may breathe more freely and go on his way unmolested, at least for a time. Thus it comes about that the endeavor of primitive people to make a clean sweep of all their troubles generally takes the form of a grand hunting out and expulsion of devils or ghosts. They think that if they can only shake off these, their accursed tormentors, they will make a fresh start in life, happy and innocent. The tales of Eden and the old poetic golden age will come true again. Subsection 2. The Occasional Expulsion of Evils. We can therefore understand why those general clearances of evil to which from time to time the savage resorts should commonly take the form of a forcible expulsion of devils. In these evil spirits, primitive man sees the cause of many, if not most, of his troubles, and he fancies that if he can only deliver himself from them, things will go better with him. The public attempts to expel the accumulated ills of a whole community may be divided into two classes, according as the expelled evils are immaterial and invisible, or are embodied in a material vehicle or scapegoat. The former may be called the direct or immediate expulsion of evils, the latter the indirect or immediate expulsion, or the expulsion by scapegoat. We begin with examples of the former. In the island of Rook, between New Guinea and New Britain, when any misfortune has happened, all the people run together, scream, curse, howl, and beat the air with sticks to drive away the devil, who is supposed to be the author of the mishap. 
From the spot where the mishap took place, they drive him step by step to the sea, and on reaching the shore, they redouble their shouts and blows in order to expel him from the island. He generally retires to the sea or to the island of Lawton. The natives of New Britain ascribe sickness, drought, the failure of crops, and in short all misfortunes to the influence of wicked spirits. So at times, when many people sicken and die, as at the beginning of the rainy season, all the inhabitants of a district, armed with branches and clubs, go out by moonlight to the fields, where they beat and stamp on the ground with wild howls all morning, believing that this drives away the devils. And for the same purpose, they rush through the village with burning torches. The natives of New Caledonia are said to believe that all evils are caused by a powerful and malignant spirit. Hence, in order to rid themselves of him, they will from time to time dig a great pit, round which the whole tribe gathers. After cursing the demon, they fill up the pit with earth and trample on the top with loud shouts. This they call burying the evil spirit. Among the Dieri tribe of Central Australia, when a serious illness occurs, the medicine men expel Kuchi, or the devil, by beating the ground in and outside of the camp with the stuffed tail of a kangaroo, until they have chased a demon away to some distance from the camp. When a village has been visited by a series of disasters or a severe epidemic, the inhabitants of Manasa and Celebus lay the blame upon the devils who are infesting the village and who must be expelled from it. Accordingly, early one morning, all the people, men, women, and children, quit their homes, carrying their household goods with them, and take up their quarters in temporary huts, which have been erected outside the village. Here they spend several days offering sacrifices and preparing for the final ceremony. At last, the men, some wearing masks, others with their faces blackened, and so on, but all armed with swords, guns, pikes, or brooms, steal cautiously and silently back to the deserted village. Then, at a signal from the priest, they rush furiously up and down the streets and into and under the houses, which are raised on piles above the ground, yelling and striking on walls, doors, and windows to drive away the devils. Next, the priests and the rest of the people come with the holy fire and march nine times round each house and thrice round the ladder that leads up to it, carrying the fire with them. Then they take the fire into the kitchen, where it must burn for three days continuously. The devils are now driven away, and great in general is the joy. The Alfors of Halmahara attribute epidemics to the devil who comes from their village to carry them off. So in order to rid the village of the disease, the sorcerer drives away the devil. From all the villagers, he receives a costly garment and places it on four vessels which he takes to the forest and leaves at a spot where the devil is supposed to be. Then, with mocking words, he bids the demon abandon the place. In the key islands to the southwest of New Guinea, the evil spirits, who are quite distinct from the souls of the dead, form a mighty host. Almost every tree and every cave is the lodging place of one of these fiends, who are, moreover, extremely irascible and apt to fly out on the smallest provocation. They manifest their displeasure by sending sickness and other calamities. Hence, in times of public misfortune, as when an epidemic is raging and all other remedies have failed, the whole population go forth with the priest at their head to a place at some distance from the village. Here at sunset, they erect a couple of poles with a crossbar between them, to which they attach bags of rice, wooden models of pivot guns, gongs, bracelets, and so on. Then, when everybody has taken his place at the poles, and a death-like silence reigns, the priest lifts up his voice and addresses the spirits in their own language as follows, Ho, 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 ye evil spirits who dwell in the trees, ye evil spirits who live in the grottoes, ye evil spirits who lodge in the earth, we give you these pivot guns, these gongs, etc. Let the sickness cease, and not so many people die of it. Then everybody runs home, fast as their legs can carry them. In the island of Nias, when a man is seriously ill and other remedies have been tried in vain, the sorcerer proceeds to exorcise the devil who is causing the illness. A pole is set up in front of the house, and from the top of the pole a rope of palm leaves is stretched to the roof of the house. Then the sorcerer mounts the roof with a pig, which he kills and allows to roll from the roof to the ground. The devil, anxious to get the pig, lets himself down hastily from the roof by the rope of palm leaves, and a good spirit invoked by the sorcerer prevents him from climbing up again. If this remedy fails, it is believed that other devils must still be lurking in the house. So a general hunt is made after them. All the doors and windows in the house are closed, except a single dormer window in the roof. 
The men shut up in the house, hue and slash with their swords, right and left, to the clash of gongs and the rub-a-dub of drums. Terrified at this onslaught, the devils escape by the dormer window, and sliding down the rope of palm leaves take themselves off. As all the doors and windows except the one in the roof are shut, the devils cannot get into the house again. In the case of an epidemic, the proceedings are similar. All the gates of the village except one are closed. Every voice is raised, every gong and drum beaten, every sword brandished. Thus the devils are driven out, and the last gate is shut behind them. For eight days thereafter, the village is in a state of siege, no one being allowed to enter it. When cholera has broken out in a Burmese village, the able-bodied men scramble on the roofs and lay about them with bamboos and billets of wood, while all the rest of the population, old and young, stand below and thump drums, blow trumpets, yell scream, beat floors, walls, tin pans, everything to make a din. This uproar, repeated on three successive nights, is thought to be very effective in driving away the cholera demons. When smallpox first appeared amongst the Kumis of southeastern India, they thought it was a devil come from Arakan. The villages were placed in a state of siege, no one being allowed to leave or enter them. A monkey was killed by being dashed on the ground, and its body was hung at the village gate. Its blood, mixed with small river pebbles, was sprinkled on the houses. The threshold of every house was swept with the monkey tail, and the fiend was adjured to depart. When an epidemic is raging on the Gold Coast of West Africa, the people will sometimes turn out, armed with clubs and torches, to drive the evil spirits away. At a given signal, the whole population begin with frightful yells to beat in every corner of the houses, then rush like mad into the streets, waving torches and striking frantically in the empty air. The uproar goes on till somebody reports that the cowed and daunted demons have made good their escape by a gate of the town or village. The people stream out after them, pursue them for some distance into the forest, and warn them never to return. The expulsion of the devils is followed by a general massacre of all the cocks in the village or town, lest, by their unreasonable crowing, they should betray to the banished demons the direction they must take to return to their old homes. When sickness was prevalent in a Huron village, and all other remedies had been tried in vain, the Indians had recourse to the ceremony called Lunoi Roya, which is the principal invention and most proper means, so they say, to expel from the town or village the devils and evil spirits which cause, induce, and import all the maladies and infirmities which they suffer in body and mind. Accordingly, one evening the men would begin to rush like madmen about the village, breaking and upsetting whatever they came across in the wigwams. They threw fire and burning brands about the streets, and all night long they ran howling and singing without cessation. Then they all dreamed of something, a knife, dog, skin, or whatever it might be, and when morning came they went from wigwam to wigwam asking for presents. These they received silently, till the particular thing was given them which they had dreamt about. On receiving it, they uttered a cry of joy, and rushed from the hut amid the congratulations of all present. The health of those who received what they had dreamed of was believed to be assured, whereas those who did not get what they had set their hearts upon regarded their fate as sealed. Sometimes, instead of chasing the demon of disease from their homes, savages prefer to leave him in peaceable possession, while they themselves take to flight and attempt to prevent him from following in their tracks. Thus, when the Patagonians were attacked by smallpox, which they attributed to the machinations of an evil spirit, they used to abandon their sick and flee, slashing the air with their weapons and throwing water about in order to keep off the dreadful pursuer. And when after several days' march they reached a place where they hoped to be beyond his reach, they used by way of precaution to plant all their cutting weapons with the sharp edges turned upwards, the quarter from which they had come, as if they were repelling a charge of cavalry. Similarly, when the Lulis or Tanakotis Indians of the Gran Chaco were attacked by an epidemic, they regularly sought to evade it by flight. But in so doing, they always followed a sinuous, not a straight course, because they said that when the disease made after them, he would be so exhausted by the turnings and windings of the route that he would never be able to come up with them. When the Indians of New Mexico were decimated by smallpox or other infectious disease, they used to shift their quarters every day, retreating into the most sequestered parts of the mountains and choosing the thorniest thickets they could find in the hope that the smallpox would be too afraid of scratching himself on the thorns to follow them. When some chins, on a visit to Rangoon, were attacked by cholera, they went about with drawn swords to scare away the demon, and they spent the day hiding under bushes, so that he might not be able to find them. Subsection 3 
the periodic expulsion of evils. The expulsion of evils from being occasional tends to become periodic. It comes to be thought desirable to have a general riddance of evil spirits at fixed times, usually once a year, in order that the people may make a fresh start in life, freed from all the malignant influences which have been long accumulating about them. Some of the Australian blacks annually expelled the ghosts of the dead from their territory. The ceremony was witnessed by the Rev. W. Ridley on the banks of the River Barwon, a chorus of twenty old and young were singing and beating time with boomerangs. Suddenly, from under a sheet of bark, darted a man with his body whitened by pipe clay, his head and face colored with lines of red and yellow, and a tuft of feathers fixed by means of a stick two feet above the crown of his head. He stood twenty minutes perfectly still, gazing upwards. An aboriginal who stood by told me he was looking for the ghosts of dead men. At last he began to move very slowly, and soon rushed to and fro at full speed, flourishing a branch as if to drive away some foes invisible to us. When I thought this pantomime must be almost over, ten more similarly adorned suddenly appeared from behind the trees, and the whole party joined in a brisk conflict with the mysterious assailants. At last, after some rapid evolutions in which they put forth all their strength, they rested from the exciting toil which they had kept up all night and for some hours after sunrise. They seemed satisfied that the ghosts were driven away for twelve months. They were performing the same ceremony at every station along the river, and I am told it is an annual custom. Certain seasons of the year mark themselves naturally out as appropriate moments for a general expulsion of devils. Such a moment occurs towards the close of an Arctic winter, when the sun reappears on the horizon after an absence of weeks or months. Accordingly, at Point Barrow, the most northerly extremity of Alaska and nearly all of America, the Eskimo choose the moment of the sun's reappearance to hunt the mischievous spirit Tunya from every house. The ceremony was witnessed by the members of the United States Polar Expedition, who wintered at Point Barrow. A fire was built in front of the council house, and an old woman was posted at the entrance to every house. The men gathered round the council house, while the young women and girls drove the spirit out of every house with their knives, stabbing viciously under the bunk and deerskins and calling upon Tunya to be gone. When they thought he had been driven out of every hole and corner, they thrust him down through the hole in the floor and chased him into the open air with loud cries and frantic gestures. Meanwhile, the old woman at the entrance of the house made passes with a long knife in the air to keep him from returning. Each party drove the spirit towards the fire and invited him to go into it. All were by this time drawn up in a semicircle around the fire. When several of the leading men made specific charges against the spirit, and each, after his speech, brushed his clothes violently, calling on the spirit to leave him and go into the fire, two men now stepped forward with rifles loaded with blank cartridges, while a third brought a vessel of urine and flung it on the flames. At the same time, one of the men fired a shot into the fire, and as the cloud of steam rose, it received the other shot, which was supposed to finish Tunya for the time being. In late autumn, when storms rage over the land and break the icy fetters by which the frozen sea is as yet but slightly bound, when the loosened flows are driven against each other and break with loud crashes, when the cakes of ice are piled in wild disorder one upon another, the Eskimo of Baffinland fancy they hear the voices of spirits who people the mischief-laden air. Then the ghosts of the dead knock wildly at the huts which they cannot enter, and woe to the hapless white whom they catch. He soon sickens and dies. Then the phantom of a huge hairless dog pursues the real dogs, which expire in convulsions and cramps at sight of him. All the countless spirits of evil are abroad, striving to bring sickness and death, foul weather and failure in hunting on the Eskimo. Most dreaded of all these spectral visitants are Sedna, mistress of the netherworld, and her father, to whose share dead Eskimo fall. While the other spirits fill the air and the water, she rises from the underground. It is then a busy season for the wizards. In every house, you may hear them singing and praying while they conjure the spirits, seated in a mystic gloom at the back of the hut, which is dimly lit by a lamp burning low. The hardest task of all is to drive away Sedna, and this is reserved for the most powerful enchanter. A rope is coiled on the floor of a large hut, in such a way as to leave a small opening at the top, which represents the breathing hole of a seal. Two enchanters stand beside it, one of them grasping a spear as if he were watching a seal hole in winter, the other holding the harpoon line. A third sorcerer sits at the back of the hut, chanting a magic song to lure Sedna to the spot. 
Now she is heard approaching under the floor of the hut, breathing heavily. Now she emerges at the hole. Now she is harpooned and sinks away in angry haste, dragging the harpoon with her, while the two men hold on to the line with all their might. The struggle is severe, but at last, by a desperate wrench, she tears herself away and returns to her dwelling in Adlivan. When the harpoon is drawn up out of the hole, it is found to be splashed with blood, which the enchanters proudly exhibit as proof of their prowess. Thus, Sedna and the other evil spirits are at last driven away, and next day a great festival is celebrated by old and young in honor of the event. But they must still be cautious, for the wounded Sedna is furious, and will seize any one she may find outside of his hut. So they all wear amulets on top of their hoods to protect themselves against her. These amulets consist of pieces of the first garments that they wore after birth. The Iroquois inaugurated the new year in January, February, or March, the time varied, with a festival of dreams, like that which the Hurons observed on special occasions. The whole ceremonies lasted several days, or even weeks, and formed a kind of Saturnalia. Men and women, variously disguised, went from wigwam to wigwam, smashing and throwing down whatever they came across. It was a time of general license. The people were supposed to be out of their senses, and therefore not to be responsible for what they did. Accordingly, many seized the opportunity of paying off old scores by belaboring obnoxious persons, drenching them with ice-cold water and covering them with filth or hot ashes. Others seized burning brands or coals and flung them at the heads of the first person they met. The only way of escaping from these persecutors was to guess what they had dreamed of. On one day of the festival, the ceremony of driving away evil spirits from the village took place. Men clothed in the skins of wild beasts, their faces covered with hideous masks, and their hands with the shell of the tortoise, went from hut to hut, making frightful noises. In every hut, they took the fuel from the fire and scattered the embers and ashes about the floor with their hands. The general confession of sins which preceded the festival was probably a preparation for the public expulsion of evil influences. It was a way of stripping the people of their moral burdens, that these might be collected and cast out. In September, the Incas of Peru celebrated a festival called Situa, the object of which was to banish from the capital and its vicinity all disease and trouble. The festival fell in September because the rains began about this time, and with the first rains there was generally much sickness. As a preparation for the festival, the people fasted on the first day of the moon after the autumnal equinox. Having fasted during the day and the night being come, they baked a coarse paste of maize. This paste was made of two sorts. One was kneaded with the blood of children aged from five to ten years, the blood being obtained by bleeding the children between the eyebrows. These two kinds of paste were baked separately because they were for different uses. Each family assembled at the house of the eldest brother to celebrate the feast, and those who had no elder brother went to the house of their next relation of greater age. On the same night, all who had fasted during the day washed their bodies, and taking a little of the blood-kneaded paste, rubbed it over their head, face, breast, shoulders, arms, and legs. They did this in order that the paste might take away all their infirmities. After this, the head of the family anointed the threshold with the same paste, and left it there as a token that the inmates of the house had performed their ablutions and cleansed their bodies." Meantime, the high priest performed the same ceremonies in the Temple of the Sun. As soon as the sun rose, all the people worshipped and besought him to drive all evils out of the city, and then they broke their fast with the paste that had been kneaded without blood. When they had paid their worship and broken their fast, which they did at a stated hour, in order that all might adore the sun as one man, an Inca of the blood royal came forth from the fortress as a messenger of the sun, richly dressed, with his mantle girded round his body, and a lance in his hand. The lance was decked with feathers of many hues, extending from the blade to the socket, and fastened with rings of gold. He ran down the hill from the fortress, brandishing his lance, till he reached the center of the great square, where stood the golden urn, like a fountain, that was used for the sacrifice of the fermented juice of the maize. Here four other Incas of the blood royal awaited him, each with a lance in his hand, and his mantle girded up to run. The messenger touched their four lances with his lance, and told them that the sun bade them, as his messengers drive the evils out of the city. The four Incas then separated and ran down the four royal roads, which led out of the city to the four quarters of the world. While they ran, all the people, great and small, came to the doors of their houses, and with great shouts of joy and gladness shook their clothes, as if they were shaking off dust. 
while they cried, let the evils be gone. How greatly desired has this festival been by us. O creator of all things, permit us to reach another year that we may see another feast like this. After they had shaken their clothes, they passed their hands over their heads, faces, arms, and legs, as if in the act of washing. All this was done to drive the evils out of their houses, that the messengers of the sun might banish them from the city. And it was done not only in the streets through which the Incas ran, but generally in all quarters of the city. Moreover, they all danced, the Inca himself amongst them, and bathed in the rivers and fountains, saying that their maladies would come out of them. Then they took great torches of straw, bound round with cords. These they lighted and passed from one to the other, striking each other with them, and saying, Let all harm go away. Meanwhile, the runners ran with their lances for a quarter of a league outside the city, where they found four other Incas ready, who received the lances from their hands and ran with them. Thus the lances were carried by relays of runners for a distance of five or six leagues, at the end of which the runners washed themselves and their weapons in rivers, and set up the lances in sign of a boundary within which the banished evils might not return. The people of Guinea annually banished the devil from all their towns, that much ceremony at a time set apart for the purpose." At Axum, on the Gold Coast, this annual expulsion is preceded by a feast of eight days, during which mirth and jollity, skipping, dancing, and singing prevail, and a perfect lampooning liberty is allowed, and scandals so highly exalted, that they may freely sing of all the faults, villainies, and frauds of their superiors, as well as inferiors, without punishment, or so much as the least interruption. On the eighth day they hunt out the devil with a dismal cry, running after him and pelting him with sticks, stones, and whatever comes to hand. When they have driven him far enough out of the town, they all return. In this way he is expelled from more than a hundred towns at the same time. To make sure that he does not return to their houses, the women wash and scour all their wooden and earthen vessels, to free them from all uncleanliness and the devil." At Cape Coast Castle, on the Gold Coast, the ceremony was witnessed on the 9th of October, 1844, by an Englishman, who has described it as follows. Tonight, the annual custom of driving the evil spirit, Abansom, out of the town has taken place. As soon as the eight o'clock gun fired in the fort, the people began firing muskets in their houses, turning all their furniture out of doors, beating about in every corner of the rooms with sticks, etc., and screaming as loudly as possible in order to frighten the devil. Being driven out of the houses, as they imagine, they sailed forth into the streets, throwing lighted torches about, shouting, screaming, beating sticks together, rattling old pans, making the most horrid noise, in order to drive him out out of the town into the sea. The custom is preceded by four weeks' dead silence. No gun is allowed to be fired, no drum to be beaten, no palavar to be made between man and man. If during these weeks two natives should disagree and make a noise in the town, they are immediately taken before the king and fined heavily. If a dog or pig, sheep or goat be found at large in the street, it may be killed or taken by anyone, the former owner not being allowed to demand any compensation. This silence is designed to deceive Abensam that, being off his guard, he may be taken by surprise and frightened out of the place. If anyone die during the silence, his relatives are not allowed to weep until the four weeks have been completed. Sometimes the date of the annual expulsion of devils is fixed with reference to their agricultural seasons. Thus, among the hoes of Togoland in West Africa, the expulsion is performed annually before the people partake of the new yams. The chiefs summon the priests and magicians, and tell them that the people are now to eat the new yams and be merry. Therefore, they must cleanse the town and remove the evils. Accordingly, the evil spirits, witches, and all the ills that infest the people are conjured into bundles of leaves and creepers, fastened to poles, which are carried away and set up in the earth on various roads outside the town. During the following night, no fire may be lit and no food eaten. Next morning, the women sweep out their herds and houses and deposit the sweepings on broken wooden plates. Then the people pray, saying, All ye sickness that are in our body and plague us, we are come today to throw you out. Thereupon they run as fast as they can in the direction of Mount Adaklu, smiting their mouths and screaming, Out today, out today, that which kills anybody out today, ye evil spirits, out today, and all that causes our heads to ache, out today, Anlo and Adaklu, are the places whither all ill shall betake itself. When they have come to a certain tree on Mount Adaklu, they throw everything away and return home. 
at Kirawina in southeastern New Guinea, when the new yams have been harvested, the people feasted and danced for many days, and a great deal of property, such as armlets, native money, and so forth, was displayed conspicuously on a platform erected for the purpose. When the festivities were over, all the people gathered together and expelled the spirits from the village by shouting, beating the posts of the houses, and overturning everything under which a wily spirit might be supposed to lurk. The explanation which the people gave to a missionary was that they had entertained and feasted the spirits and provided them with riches, and it was now time for them to take their departure. Had they not seen the dances and heard the songs and gorged themselves on the souls of the yams and appropriated the souls of the money and all the other fine things set out on the platform, what more could the spirits want? So out they must go. Among the hosts of northeastern India, the great festival of the year is the harvest home, held in January, when the granaries are full of grain and the people, to use their own expression, are full of devilry. They have a strange notion that at this period, men and women are so overcharged with vicious propensities that it is absolutely necessary for the safety of the person to let off steam by allowing for a time full vent to the passions. The ceremonies open with a sacrifice to the village god of three fowls, a cock and two hens, one of which must be black. Along with them are offered flowers of the palace tree, Butea frondosa, bread made from rice flour and sesame seeds. These offerings are presented by the village priest, who prays that during the year about to begin, they and their children may be preserved from all misfortune and sickness, and that they may have seasonable rain and good crops. Prayer is also made in some places for the souls of the dead. At this time, an evil spirit is supposed to infest the place, and to get rid of it, men, women, and children go in procession round and through every part of the village with sticks in their hands, as if beating for game, singing a wild chant and shouting vociferously till they feel assured that the evil spirit must have fled. Then they give themselves up to feasting and drinking rice beer till they are in a fit state for the wild debauch which follows." The festival now becomes a Saturnale, during which servants forget their duty to their masters, children their reverence for parents, men their respect for women, and women all notions of modesty, delicacy, and gentleness. They become raging bacchantes. Usually the hosts are quiet and reserved in manner, decorous and gentle to women. But during their festival, their natures appear to undergo a temporary change. Sons and daughters revile their parents in gross language, and parents their children. Men and women become almost like animals in the indulgence of their amorous propensities. The mandaris, kinsmen, and neighbors of the hosts keep the festival in much the same manner. The resemblance to a Saturnale is very complete, as at this festival the farm laborers are feasted by their masters, and allowed the utmost freedom of speech in addressing them. It is the festival of the harvest home, the termination of one year's toil, and a slight respite from it before they commence again. Among some of the Hindu Kush tribes, as amongst the hosts and Mandaris, the expulsion of devils takes place after harvest. When the last crop of autumn has been got in, it is thought necessary to drive away evil spirits from the granaries. A kind of porridge is eaten, and the head of the family takes his matchlock and fires it into the floor. Then, going outside, he sets to work, loading and firing, till his powder horn is exhausted, while all his neighbors are similarly employed. The next day is spent in rejoicings. In Chitral, this festival is called devil driving. On the other hand, the Khans of India expel the devils at seed time instead of at harvest. At this time, they worship Pateri Panu, the god of increase and of gain in every shape. On the first day of the festival, a rude car is made of a basket set upon a few sticks, tied upon the bamboo rollers for wheels. The priest takes this car first to the house of the lineal head of the tribe, to whom precedence is given in all ceremonies connected with agriculture. Here he receives a little of each kind of seed and some feathers. He then takes the car to all the other houses in the village, each of which contributes the same things. Lastly, the car is conducted to a field without the village, attended by all the young men who beat each other and strike the air violently with long sticks. The seed thus carried out is called the share of the evil spirits, spoilers of the seed. These are considered to be driven out with the car, and when it and its contents are abandoned to them, they are held to have no excuse for interfering with the rest of the seed corn. The people of Bali, an island to the east of Java, have periodical expulsions of devils upon a great scale. 
Generally, the time chosen for the expulsion is the day of the dark moon in the ninth month. When the demons have been long unmolested, the country is said to be warm, and the priest issues orders to expel them by force, lest the whole of Bali should be rendered uninhabitable. On the day appointed, the people of the village or district assemble at the principal temple. Here at a crossroad, offerings are set out for the devils. After prayers have been recited by the priests, the blast of a horn summons the devils to partake of the meal which has been prepared for them. At the same time, a number of men step forward and light their torches at the holy lamp, which burns before the chief priest. Immediately afterwards, followed by the bystanders, they spread in all directions and march through the streets and lanes, crying, Depart! Go away! Wherever they pass, the people who have stayed at home hasten, by a deafening clatter on doors, beans, rice blocks, and so forth, to take their share in the expulsion of devils. Thus chased from the houses, the fiends flee to the banquet, which has been set out for them. But here the priest receives them with curses, which finally drive them from the district. When the last devil has taken his departure, the uproar is succeeded by a dead silence, which lasts during the next day also. The devils, it is thought, are anxious to return to their old homes, and in order to make them think that Bali is not Bali, but some desert island, no one may stir from his own abode for 24 hours. Even ordinary household work, including cooking, is discontinued. Only the watchmen may show themselves in the streets." Wreaths of thorns and leaves are hung at all the entrances to warn strangers from entering. Not till the third day is this state of siege raised, and even then it is forbidden to work at the rice fields or to buy and sell in the market. Most people still stay at home, whiling away the time with cards and dice. In Tonquin, a thekida, or general expulsion of malevolent spirits, commonly took place once a year, especially if there was a great mortality amongst men, the elephants or horses of the general's stable, or the cattle of the country, the cause of which they attribute to the malicious spirits of such men as have been put to death for treason, rebellion, and conspiring the death of the king, general, or princes, and that in revenge of the punishment they have suffered, they are bent to destroy everything and commit horrible violence. To prevent which their superstition has suggested to them the institution of this thekida as a proper means to drive the devil away and purge the country of evil spirits. The day appointed for the ceremony was generally the 25th of February, one month after the beginning of the new year, which fell on the 25th of January. The intermediate month was a season of feasting, merrymaking of all kinds, and general license. During the whole month, the great seal was kept shut up in a box, face downwards, and the law was, as it were, laid asleep. All courts of justice were closed. Debtors could not be seized. Small crimes such as petty larceny, fighting, and assault escaped with impunity. Only treason and murder were taken account of, and the malefactors detained till the great seal should come into operation again. At the close of the Saturnalia, the wicked spirits were driven away, great masses of troops and artillery having been drawn up with flying colors and all the pomp of war. The general beginneth then to offer meat offerings to the criminal devils and malevolent spirits, for it is usual and customary likewise amongst them to feast the condemned before their execution, inviting them to eat and drink, when presently he accuses them in a strange language, by characters and figures, etc., of many offenses and crimes committed by them, as to their having disquieted the land, killed his elephants and horses, etc., for all which they justly deserve to be chastised and banished the country." whereupon three great guns are fired as the last signal, upon which all the artillery and muskets are discharged, that, by their most terrible noise, the devils may be driven away, and they are so blind as to believe for certain that they really and effectually put them to flight. In Cambodia, the expulsion of evil spirits took place in March. Bits of broken statues and stones, considered as the abode of the demons, were collected and brought to the capital. Here, as many elephants were collected as could be got together. On the evening of the full moon, volleys of musketry were fired, and the elephants charged furiously to put the devils to flight. The ceremony was performed on three successive days. In Siam, the banishment of demons is annually carried into effect. On the last day of the old year, a signal gun is fired from the palace. It is answered from the next station, and so on from station to station, till the firing has reached the outer gate of the city. 
Thus, the demons are driven out step by step. As soon as this is done, a consecrated rope is fastened round the circuit of the city walls to prevent the banished demons from returning. The rope is made of tough couch grass and is painted in alternate stripes of red, yellow, and blue. Annual expulsions of demons, witches, and evil influences appear to have been common among the heathen of Europe, if we may judge from the relics of such customs among their descendants at the present day. Thus, among the heathen Wochaks, a Finnish people of eastern Russia, all the young girls of the village assemble on the last day of the year or on New Year's Day, armed with sticks, the ends of which are split in nine places. With these, they beat every corner of the house and yard, saying, We are driving Satan out of the village. Afterwards, the sticks are thrown into the river below the village, and as they float downstream, Satan goes with them to the next village, from which he must be driven out in turn. In some villages, the expulsion is managed otherwise. The unmarried men receive from every house in the village groats, flesh, and brandy. These they take to the field, light a fire under a fir tree, boil the groats, and eat of the food they have brought with them, after pronouncing the words, Go away into the wilderness, come not into the house. Then they return to the village, and enter every house where there are young women. They take hold of the young women, and throw them into the snow, saying, May the spirits of disease leave you. The remains of the groats and the other food are then distributed among all the houses in proportion to the amount that each contributed, and each family consumes its share. According to a Wochak of the Malmies district, the young men throw into the snow whomever they find in the houses, and this is called driving out Satan. Moreover, some of the boiled groats are cast into the fire with the words, O oh God, afflict us not with sickness and pestilence. Give us not up as they pray to the spirits of the wood. But the most antique form of the ceremony is that observed by the Rotiaks of the Kassan government. First of all, a sacrifice is offered to the devil at noon. Then all the men assemble on horseback in the center of the village and decide with which house they shall begin. When this question, which often gives rise to hot disputes, is settled, they tether their horses to the paling and arm themselves with whips, clubs of limewood, and bundles of lighted twigs. The lighted twigs are believed to have the greatest terrors for Satan. Thus armed, they proceed with frightful cries to beat every corner of the house and yard, then shut the door and spit at the ejected fiend. So they go from house to house till the devil has been driven from everyone. Then they mount their horses and ride out of the village, yelling wildly and brandishing their clubs in every direction. Outside of the village, they fling away the clubs and spit once more at the devil. The Cherimus, another Finnish people of eastern Russia, chase Satan from their dwellings by beating the walls with cudgels of limewood. For the same purpose, they fire guns, stab the ground with knives, and insert burning chips of wood in the crevices. Also, they leap over bonfires, shaking out their garments as they do so, and in some districts, they blow on long trumpets of lime tree bark to frighten him away. When he has fled to the wood, they pelt the trees with some of the cheesecakes and eggs which furnish the feast. In Christian Europe, the old heathen custom of expelling the powers of evil at certain times of the year has survived to modern times. Thus, in some villages of Calabria, the month of March is inaugurated with the expulsion of the witches. It takes place at night to the sound of the church bells, the people running about the streets and crying, March is come! They say that the witches roam about in March, and the ceremony is repeated every Friday evening during the month. Often, as might have been anticipated, the ancient pagan rite has attached itself to church festivals. In Albania on Easter Eve, the young people light torches of resinous wood and march in procession, swinging them through the village. At last, they throw the torches into the river, crying, Ha, Kore, we throw you into the river, like these torches that you may never return. Silesian peasants believe that on Good Friday, the witches go their rounds and have great power for mischief. Hence, about Oels near Strelitz, the people on the day arm themselves with old brooms and drive the witches from the house and home, from farmyard and cattle stall, making a great uproar and clatter as they do so. In Central Europe, the favorite time for expelling the witches is, or was, Walpurgis Night, the eve of May Day. When the baleful powers of these mischievous beings were supposed to be at their height, in the Tyrol, for example, as in other places, the expulsion of the powers of evil at this season goes by the name of burning out the witches. It takes place on May Day, but people have been busy with their preparations for days before. On a Thursday at midnight, bundles are made up of resinous splinters, black and red spotted hemlock, caper spurge, rosemary, and twigs of the slow. These are kept and burned on May Day by men who must first have received plenary absolution from the church. On the last three days of April, all the houses are cleansed and fumigated with juniper berries and rue. 
on May Day, when the evening bell has rung and the twilight is falling, the ceremony of burning off the witches begins. Men and boys make a racket with whips, bells, pots, and pans. The women carry censers. The dogs are unchained and run barking and yelping about. As soon as the church bells begin to ring, the bundles of twigs fastened on poles are set on fire and the incense is ignited. Then all the house bells and dinner bells are rung, pots and pans are clashed, dogs bark and everyone must make a noise, and amid this hubbub all scream at the pitch of their voices, Witch, flee! Flee from here, or it will go ill with thee! Then they run seven times round the houses, the yards, and the village, so the witches are smoked out of their lurking places and driven away. The custom of expelling the witches on Wolpurgis night is still, or was down to recent years, observed in many parts of Bavaria and among the Germans of Bohemia. Thus, in the Bomerwald Mountains, all the young fellows of the village assemble after sunset on some height, especially at a crossroad, and crack whips for a while in unison with all their strength. This drives away the witches, for so far as the sound of the whips is heard, these maleficent beings can do no harm. In some places, while the young men are cracking their whips, the herdsmen wind their horns, and the long-drawn notes, heard far off in the silence of night, are very effectual for banning the witches. Another witching time is the period of twelve days between Christmas and Epiphany. Hence, in some parts of Silesia, the people burn pine resin all night long between Christmas and New Year, in order that the pungent smoke may drive witches and evil spirits far away from house and homestead. And on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, they fire shots over fields and meadows into shrubs and trees and wrap straw around the fruit trees to prevent the spirits from doing them harm. On New Year's Eve, which is St. Sylvester's Day, Bohemian lads, armed with guns, form themselves into circles and fire thrice into the air. This is called shooting the witches, and is supposed to frighten the witches away. The last of the mystic twelve days is Epiphany, or Twelfth Night, and it has been selected as a proper season for the expulsion of the powers of evil in various parts of Europe. Thus, in Brunnen, on the Lake of Lucerne, Boys go about in procession on Twelfth Night, carrying torches and making a great noise with horns, bells and whips, and so forth, to frighten away two female spirits of the wood, Strudelli and Stratelli. The people think that if they do not make enough noise, there will be little fruit that year. Again in Lubriguerre, a canton of southern France, on the eve of Twelfth Day, the people run through the streets, jangling bells, clattering kettles, and doing everything to make a discordant noise. Then, by the light of torches and blazing faggots, they set up a prodigious hue and cry in the ear-splitting roar, hoping thereby to chase all the wandering ghosts and devils from the town. Chapter 57. Public Scapegoats. Subsection 1. The Expulsion of Embodied Evils. Thus far we have dealt with that class of the general expulsion of evils, which I have called direct or immediate. In this class the evils are invisible, at least to common eyes, and the mode of deliverance consists, for the most part, in beating the empty air and raising such a hubbub as may scare the mischievous spirits and put them to flight. It remains to illustrate the second class of expulsions in which the evil influences are embodied in a visible form, or are at least supposed to be loaded upon a material medium, which acts as a vehicle to draw them off from the people, village, or town. The Palmos of California celebrate an expulsion of devils every seven years, at which the devils are represented by disguised men. Twenty or thirty men array themselves in harlequin rig and barbaric paint and put vessels of pitch on their heads. Then they secretly go out into the surrounding mountains. These are to personify the devils. A herald goes up to the top of the assembly house and makes a speech to the multitude. At a signal agreed upon in the evening, the masqueraders come in from the mountains with the vessels of pitch flaming on their heads, and with all the frightful accessories of noise, motion, and costume which the savage mind can devise in representation of demons. The terrified women and children flee for life. The men huddle them inside a circle, and on the principle of fighting the devil with fire, they swing blazing firebrands in the air, yell, whoop, and make frantic dashes at the marauding and bloodthirsty devils, so creating a terrific spectacle and striking great fear into the hearts of the assembled hundreds of women who are screaming and fainting and clinging to their valorous protectors. Finally, the devils succeed in getting into the assembly house, and the bravest of the men enter and hold a parley with them. As a conclusion of the whole farce, the men summon courage, the devils are expelled from the assembly house, and with a prodigious row and racket of sham fighting, are chased away into the mountains. In spring, as soon as the willow leaves 
were full grown on the banks of the river, the Mandan Indians celebrated their great annual festival, one of the features of which was the expulsion of the devil. A man painted black to represent the devil entered the village from the prairie, chased and frightened the women, and acted the part of a buffalo bull in the buffalo dance, the object of which was to ensure a plentiful supply of buffaloes during the ensuing year. Finally, he was chased from the village, the women pursuing him with hisses and gibes, beating him with sticks and pelting him with dirt. Some of the native tribes of central Queensland believe in a noxious being called Molonga, who prowls unseen and would kill men and violate women if certain ceremonies were not performed. These ceremonies last for five nights and consist of dances, in which only men, fantastically painted and adorned, take part. On the fifth night, Molonga himself, personified by man, tricked out with red ochre and feathers, and carrying a long feather-tipped spear, rushes forth from the darkness at the spectators and makes as if he would run through them. Great is the excitement, loud are the shrieks and shouts, but after another feigned attack, the demon vanishes in the gloom. On the last night of the year, the palace of the kings of Cambodia is purged of devils. Men painted as fiends are chased by elephants about the palace courts. When they have been expelled, a consecrated thread of cotton is stretched round the palace to keep them out. In Munzerabad, a district of Mysore in southern India, when cholera or smallpox is broken out in a parish, the inhabitants assemble and conjure the demon of the disease into a wooden image, which they carry, generally at midnight, into the next parish. The inhabitants of that parish, in like manner, pass the image on to their neighbors, and thus the demon is expelled from one village after another, until he comes to the bank of a river, into which he is finally thrown. Oftener, however, the expelled demons are not represented at all, but are understood to be present invisibly in the material and visible vehicle which conveys them away. Here again, it will be convenient to distinguish between occasional and periodical expulsions. We begin with the former. Subsection 2. The Occasional Expulsion of Evils in a Material Vehicle The vehicle which conveys away the demons may be of various kinds. A common one is a little ship or boat. Thus, in the southern district of the island of Saram, when a whole village suffers from sickness, a small ship is made and filled with rice, tobacco, eggs, and so forth, which have been contributed by all the people. A little sail is hoisted on the ship. When all is ready, a man calls out in a very loud voice, O oh, all ye sickness, ye smallpoxes, agues, measles, etc., who have visited us so long and wasted us so sorely, but who now cease to plague us. We have made ready this ship for you, and we have furnished you with provender sufficient for the voyage. Ye shall have no lack of food, nor of areca nuts, nor of tobacco. Depart and sail away from us directly. Never come near us again, but go to a land which is far from here. Let all the tides and winds waft you speedily thither, and so convey you thither that for the time to come we may live sound and well, and that we may never see the sun rise on you again. Then ten or twelve men carry the vessel to the shore, and let it drift away with the land breeze, feeling convinced that they are free from sickness forever, or at least till the next time. If sickness attacks them again, they are sure it is not the same sickness, but a different one, which in due time they dismiss in the same manner. When the demon-laden bark is lost to sight, the bearers return to the village, whereupon a man cries out, The sickness are now gone, vanished, expelled, and sailed away. At this all the people come running out of their houses, passing the word from one to the other with great joy, beating on gongs and tinkling instruments. Similar ceremonies are commonly resorted to in other East Indian islands. Thus, in Timor Laut, to mislead the demons who are causing sickness, a small proa containing the image of a man and provisioned for a long voyage is allowed to drift away with wind and tide. As it is being launched, the people cry, O oh, sickness, go from here, turn back, what do you hear in this poor land? Three days after the ceremony, a pig is killed, and part of the flesh is offered to Dudila, who lives in the sun. One of the oldest men says, Old sir, I beseech you, make well the grandchildren, children, women, and men, that we may be able to eat pork and rice, and to drink palm wine. I will keep my promise, eat your share, and make all the people in the village well. If the proa is stranded at any inhabited spot, the sickness will break out there. Hence, a stranded proa excites much alarm amongst the coast population, and they immediately burn it, because demons fly from fire. In the island of Baru, the proa, which carries away the demons of disease, is about twenty feet long, rigged out with sails, oars, anchor, and so on, and well stocked with provisions. For a day and a night, the people beat gongs and drums, and rush about to frighten the demons. 
Next morning, ten stalwart young men strike the people with branches, which have been previously dipped in an earthen pot of water. As soon as they have done so, they run down to the beach, put the branches on board the proa, launch another boat in great haste, and tow the disease-burdened bark far out to sea. There they cast it off, and one of them calls out, "'Grandfather Smallpox, go away! Go willingly away! Go visit another land! We have made you food ready for the voyage! We have now nothing more to give!' When they have landed, all the people bathe together in the sea. In this ceremony, the reason for striking the people with the branches is clearly to rid them of the diseased demons, which are then supposed to be transferred to the branches. Hence the haste with which the branches are deposited in the proa and towed away to sea. So in the inland districts of Saram, when smallpox or other sickness is raging, the priest strikes all the houses with consecrated branches, which are then thrown into the river to be carried down to the sea. Exactly amongst the Wotaks of Russia, the sticks which have been used for expelling the devils from the village are thrown into the river, that the current may sweep the baleful burden away. The plan of putting puppets in the boat to represent sick persons in order to lure the demons after them is not uncommon. For example, most of the pagan tribes on the coast of Borneo seek to drive away epidemic diseases as follows. They carve one or more rough human images from the pith of the sago palm and place them on a small raft or boat or full-rigged Malay ship together with rice and other food. The boat is decked with blossoms of the areca palm and with ribbons made from its leaves, and thus adorned the little craft is allowed to float out to sea with the ebb tide bearing as the people fondly think or hope the sickness away with it often the vehicle which carries away the collected demons or ills of a whole community is an animal or scapegoat in the central provinces of india when cholera breaks out in a village everyone retires after sunset to his house the priests then parade the streets taking from the roof of each house a straw which is burned with an offering of rice ghee and turmeric at some shrine to the east of the village Chickens, daubed with vermilion, are driven away in the direction of the smoke and are believed to carry the disease with them. If they fail, goats are tried, and last of all, pigs. When cholera rages among the bars, malins, and kormis of India, they take a goat or a buffalo. In either case, the animal must be a female, and as black as possible. Then, having tied some grain, cloves, and red lead in a yellow cloth on its back, they turn it out of the village the animal is conducted beyond the boundary and not allowed to return. Sometimes the buffalo is marked with a red pigment and driven to the next village, where he carries the plague with him. Amongst the Dinkas, a pastoral people of the White Nile, each family possesses a sacred cow. When the country is threatened with war, famine, or any other public calamity, the chiefs of the village require a particular family to surrender their sacred cow to serve as a scapegoat. The animal is driven by the women to the brink of the river and across it to the other bank, there to wander in the wilderness and fall a prey to ravening beasts. Then the women return in silence and without looking behind them. Were they to cast a backward glance, they imagined that the ceremony would have no effect. In 1857, when the Aymara Indians of Bolivia and Peru were suffering from a plague, they loaded a black llama with the clothes of the plague-stricken people, sprinkled brandy on the clothes, and then turned the animal loose on the mountains, hoping that it would carry the pest away with it. Occasionally, the scapegoat is a man. For example, from time to time, the gods used to warn the king of Uganda that his foes, the Banyoro, were working magic against him and his people to make them die of disease. To avert such a catastrophe, the king would send a scapegoat to the frontier of Bunyaro, the land of the enemy. The scapegoat consisted of either a man and a boy, or a woman and her child, chosen because of some mark or bodily defect, which the gods had noted, and by which the victims were to be recognized. With the human victims were sent a cow, a goat, a fowl, and a dog, and a strong guard escorted them to the land which the god had indicated. There the limbs of the victims were broken, and they were left to die, a lingering death in the enemy's country, being too crippled to crawl back to Uganda. The disease or plague was thought to have been thus transferred to the victims, and to have been conveyed back in their persons to the land from which it came. Some of the aboriginal tribes of China, as a protection against pestilence, select a man of great muscular strength to act the part of scapegoat. Having besmeared his face with paint, he performs many antics with the view of enticing all pestilential and noxious influences to attach themselves to him only. He is assisted by a priest. 
finally, the scapegoat, hotly pursued by men and women beating gongs and tom-toms, is driven with great haste out of the town or village. In the Punjab, a cure for the murrain is to hire a man of the Shamar caste, turn his face away from the village, brand him with a red-hot sickle, and let him go out into the jungle, taking the moran with him. He must not look back. Subsection 3. The Periodic Expulsion of Evils in a Material Vehicle the immediate expulsion of evils by means of a scapegoat or other material vehicle, like the immediate expulsion of them in invisible form, tends to become periodic, and for a like reason. Thus, every year, generally in March, the people of Leti Moa and Lakor, islands of the Indian archipelago, send away all their diseases to sea. They make a proa about six feet long, rig it with sails, oars, rudder, and other gear, and every family deposit in it some rice, fruit, a fowl, two eggs, insects that ravage the fields, and so on. Then they let it drift away to sea, saying, Take away from here all kinds of sickness. Take them to other islands, to other lands. Distribute them in places that lie eastward, where the sun rises." The Biahas of Borneo annually send to sea a little bark laden with the sins and misfortunes of the people. The crew of any ship that falls in with the ill-omened bark at sea will suffer all the sorrows with which it is laden. A like custom is annually observed by the Dassoons of the Tuaran district in British North Borneo. The ceremony is the most important of the whole year. Its aim is to bring good luck to the village during the ensuing year by solemnly expelling all the evil spirits that may have collected in or about the houses throughout the last twelve months. The task of routing out the demons and banishing them devolves chiefly on women. Dressed in their finest array, they go in procession through the village. One of them carries a small sucking pig in a basket on her back, and all of them bear wands, with which they belabor the little pig at the appropriate moment. Its squeals help to attract the vagrant spirits. At every house, the women dance and sing, clashing castanets or cymbals of brass, and jingling bunches of little brass bells in both hands. When the performance has been repeated at every house in the village, the procession defiles down to the river, and all the evil spirits, which the performers have chased from the houses, follow them to the edge of the water. There a raft has been made ready and moored to the bank. It contains offerings of food, cloth, cooking pots and swords, and the deck is crowded with figures of men, women, animals, and birds, all made out of the leaves of the sago palm. The evil spirits now embark on the raft, and when they are all aboard, it is pushed off and allowed to float down with the current, carrying the demons with it. Should the raft run aground near the village, it is shoved off with all speed, lest the invisible passengers should seize the opportunity of landing and returning to the village. Finally, the sufferings of the little pig, whose squeals serve to decoy the demons from their lurking places, are terminated by death, for it is killed and its carcass thrown away. Every year, at the beginning of the dry season, the Nicobar Islanders carry the model of a ship through their villages. The devils are chased out of the huts and driven on board the little ship which is then launched and suffered to sail away with the wind. The ceremony has been described by a catechist who witnessed it at Kar Nicobar in July 1897. For three days, the people were busy preparing two very large floating cars, shaped like canoes, fitted with sails and loaded with certain leaves, which possessed the valuable property of expelling devils. While the young people were thus engaged, the exorcists and the elders sat in a house singing songs by turns. But often they would come forth, pace the beach armed with rods, and forbid the devil to enter the village. The fourth day of solemnity bore a name which means expelling the devil by sails. In the evening all the villagers assembled, the women bringing baskets of ashes and bunches of devil-expelling leaves. These leaves were then distributed to everybody, old and young. When all was ready, a band of robust men, attended by a guard of exorcists, carried one of the cars down to the sea on the right side of the village graveyard, and set it floating in the water. As soon as they had returned, another band of men carried the other car to the beach, and floated it similarly in the sea to the left of the graveyard. The demon-laden barks being now launched, the women threw ashes from the shore, and the whole crowd shouted, singing, Fly away, devil, fly away, never come again. The wind and the tide being favorable, the canoes sailed quickly away, and that night all the people feasted together with great joy, because the devil had departed in the direction of Chaura. A similar expulsion of devils takes place once a year in the other Nicobar villages, but the ceremonies are held at different times in different places. 
amongst many of the aboriginal tribes of China, a great festival is celebrated in the third month of every year. It is held by way of a general rejoicing over what the people believe to be a total annihilation of the ills of the past 12 months. The destruction is supposed to be effected in the following way. A large earthenware jar filled with gunpowder, stones, and bits of iron is buried in the earth. A train of gunpowder communicating with the jar is then laid, and a match being applied, the jar and its contents are blown up. The stones and bits of iron represent the ills and disasters of the past year, and the dispersion of them by the explosion is believed to remove the ills and disasters themselves. The festival is attended with much reveling and drunkenness. At Old Calabar, on the coast of Guinea, the devils and ghosts are, or used to be, publicly expelled once in two years. Among the spirits thus driven from their haunts are the souls of all the people who died since the last lustration of the town, about three weeks or a month before the expulsion, which according to one account takes place in the month of November, rude effigies representing men and animals, such as crocodiles, leopards, elephants, bullocks, and birds, are made of wickerwork or wood, and being hung with strips of cloth and bedizened with gugaws, are set before the door of every house." About three o'clock in the morning of the day appointed for the ceremony, the whole population turns out into the streets and proceeds with a deafening uproar and in a state of the wildest excitement to drive all lurking devils and ghosts into the effigies in order that they may be banished with them from the abodes of men. For this purpose, bands of people roam through the streets, knocking on doors, firing guns, beating drums, blowing on horns, ringing bells, clattering pots and pans, shouting and hallooing with might and main, in short, making all the noise it is possible for them to raise. The hubbub goes on to the approach of dawn, when it gradually subsides and ceases altogether at sunrise. By this time, the houses have been thoroughly swept, and all the frightening spirits are supposed to have huddled into the effigies or their fluttering drapery. In these wicker figures are also deposited the sweepings of the houses and the ashes of yesterday's fires. Then the demon-laden images are hastily snatched up, carried in tumultuous procession down to the brink of the river, and thrown into the water to the tuck of drums. The ebb tide bears them away seaward, and thus the town is swept clean of ghosts and devils for another two years. Similar annual expulsions of embodied evils are not unknown in Europe. On the evening of Easter Sunday, the gypsies of southern Europe take a wooden vessel like a bandbox, which rests cradle-wise on two cross pieces of wood. In this, they place herbs and simples, together with the dried carcass of a snake or lizard, which every person present must first have touched with his fingers. The vessel is then wrapped in white and red wool, carried by the oldest man from tent to tent, and finally thrown into running water. Not before, however, every member of the band has spat into it once, and the sorceress has uttered some spells over it. They believe that by performing the ceremony, they dispel all the illness that would otherwise have afflicted them in the course of the year, and that if anyone finds the vessel and opens it out of curiosity, he and his will be visited by all the maladies which the others have escaped." The scapegoat, by means of which the accumulated ills of a whole year are publicly expelled, is sometimes an animal. For example, among the Garos of Assam, besides the sacrifices for individual cases of illness, there are certain ceremonies which are observed once a year by a whole community or village and are intended to safeguard its members from dangers of the forest and from sickness and mishap during the coming 12 months. The principal of these is the Asangtada ceremony. Close to the outskirts of every big village, a number of stones may be noticed, stuck into the ground, apparently without order or method. These are known by the name of a song, and on them is offered the sacrifice which the Sanctata demands. The sacrifice of a goat takes place, a month later, that of a langur, entelis monkey, or a bamboo rat, is considered necessary. The animal chosen has a rope fastened round its neck and is led by two men, one on each side of it, to every house in the village. It is taken inside each house in turn, the assembled villagers, meanwhile beating the walls from the outside to frighten and drive out any evil spirits which may have taken up their residence within. The round of the village having been made in this manner, the monkey or rat is led to the outskirts of the village, killed by a blow of a dao which disembowels it, and then crucified on bamboos set up in the ground. Round the crucified animal, long, sharp bamboo stakes are placed, which form chevaux de frise, round about it. These commemorate the days when such defenses surrounded the villages on all sides to keep off human enemies, and they are now a symbol to ward off sickness and dangers to life from the wild animals of the forest. 
The languor required for the purpose is hunted down some days before, but should it be found impossible to catch one, a brown monkey may take its place. A hulak may not be used. Here, the crucified ape or rat is the public scapegoat, which by its vicarious sufferings and death relieves the people from all sickness and mishap in the coming year. Again, on one day of the year, the Botias of Duhar in the Western Himalayas take a dog, intoxicate him with spirits and bang or hemp, and having fed him with sweetmeats, lead him round the village and let him loose. They then chase and kill him with sticks and stones and believe that when they have done so, no disease or misfortune will visit the village during the year. In some parts of Breadalbane, it was formerly the custom on New Year's Day to take a dog to the door, give him a bit of bread and drive him out saying, get away, you dog. Whatever death of men or loss of cattle would happen in this house to the end of the present year made all light on your head. On the Day of Atonement, which was the tenth day of the seventh month, the Jewish high priest laid both his hands on the head of a live goat, confessed over it all the inequities of the children of Israel, and having thereby transferred the sins of the people to the beast, sent it away into the wilderness. The scapegoat, upon whom the sins of the people are periodically laid, may also be a human being. At Onitsha on the Niger, two human beings used to be annually sacrificed to take away the sins of the land. The victims were purchased by public subscription. All persons who, during the past year, had fallen into gross sins, such as incendiarism, theft, adultery, witchcraft, and so forth, were expected to contribute 28 ngugas, or a little over two pounds. The money thus collected was taken into the interior of the country and expended in the purchase of two sickly persons to be offered as a sacrifice for all these abominable crimes, one for the land and one for the river. A man from the neighboring town was hired to put them to death. On the 27th of February, 1858, the Rev. J.C. Taylor witnessed the sacrifice of one of these victims. The sufferer was a woman about 19 or 20 years of age. They dragged her alive along the ground, face downwards from the king's house to the river, a distance of two miles. The crowds who accompanied her crying, wickedness, wickedness, the intention was to take away the inequities of the land. The body was dragged along in a merciless manner, as if the weight of all their wickedness was thus carried away. Similar customs are said to be still secretly practiced every year by many tribes in the delta of the Niger, in spite of the vigilance of the British government. Among the Yoruba people of West Africa, the human victim chosen for sacrifice, and who may be either a freeborn or a slave, a person of noble or wealthy parentage, or one of humble birth, is, after he has been chosen and marked out for the purpose, called an aluo. He is always well fed and nourished, and supplied with whatever he should desire during the period of his confinement. When the occasion arrives for him to be sacrificed and offered up, he is commonly led about and paraded through the streets of the town or city of the sovereign, who would sacrifice him for the well-being of his government and of every family and individual under it, in order that he might carry off the sin, guilt, misfortune, and death of all without exception. Ashes and chalk would be employed to hide his identity by the one being freely thrown over his head, and his face painted with the latter whilst individuals would often rush out of their houses to lay their hands upon him, that they might thus transfer to him their sin, guilt, trouble, and death. This parade over, he is taken to an inner sanctuary and beheaded. His last words or dying groans are the signal for an outburst of joy among the people assembled outside, who believe that the sacrifice has been accepted and the divine wrath appeased. In Siam, it used to be the custom on one day of the year to single out a woman, broken down by debauchery, and carry her on a litter through all the streets to the music of drums and hot boys. The mob insulted her and pelted her with dirt, and after having carried her through the whole city, they threw her on a dunghill or a hedge of thorns outside the ramparts, forbidding her ever to enter the walls again. They believed that the woman thus drew upon herself all the malign influences of the air and of evil spirits. The Pataks of Sumatra offer either a red horse or a buffalo as a public sacrifice to purify the land and obtain the favor of the gods. Formerly, it is said a man was bound to the same stake as the buffalo, and when they killed the animal, the man was driven away. No one might receive him, converse with him, or give him food. 
Doubtless, he was supposed to carry away the sins and misfortunes of the people. Sometimes the scapegoat is a divine animal. The people of Malabar share the Hindu reverence for the cow to kill and eat, which they esteem to be a crime as heinous as homicide or willful murder. Nevertheless, the Brahmins transfer the sins of the people into one or more cows, which are then carried away. Both the cows and the sins wherewith these beasts are charged, to what place the Brahmins shall appoint. When the ancient Egyptians sacrificed a bull, they invoked upon its head all the evils that might otherwise befall themselves and the land of Egypt, and thereupon they either sold the bull's head to the Greeks or cast it into the river. Now, it cannot be said that in the times known to us, the Egyptians worshipped bulls in general, for they seem to have commonly killed and eaten them. But a good many circumstances point to the conclusion that originally all cattle, bulls, as well as cows, were held sacred by the Egyptians. For not only were all cows esteemed holy by them and never sacrificed, but even bulls might not be sacrificed unless they had certain natural marks." a priest examined every bull before it was sacrificed. If it had the proper marks, he put his seal on the animal in token that it might be sacrificed. And if a man sacrificed a bull which had not been sealed, he was put to death. Moreover, the worship of the black bulls, Apis and Nevis, especially the former, played an important part in Egyptian religion. All bulls that died a natural death were carefully buried in the suburbs of the cities, and their bones were afterwards collected from all parts of Egypt and interred in a single spot. And at the sacrifice of a bull in the great rites of Isis, all the worshippers beat their breasts and mourned. On the whole, then, we are perhaps entitled to infer that bulls were originally, as cows were, always esteemed sacred by the Egyptians, and that the slain bull, upon whose head they laid the misfortunes of the people, was once a divine scapegoat. It seems not improbable that the lamb annually slain by the Maddies of Central Africa is a divine scapegoat, and the same supposition may partly explain the Zuni sacrifice of the turtle. Lastly, the scapegoat may be a divine man. Thus, in November, the Gons of India worship Gansayam Dio, the protector of the crops, and at the festival the god himself is said to descend on the head of one of the worshippers, who is suddenly seized with a kind of fit, and, after staggering about, rushes off into the jungle, where it is believed that, if left to himself, he would die mad. However, they bring him back, but he does not recover his senses for one or two days. The people think that one man is thus singled out as a scapegoat for the sins of the rest of the village. In the temple of the moon, the Albanians of the eastern Caucasus kept a number of sacred slaves, of whom many were inspired and prophesied. When one of these men exhibited more than usual symptoms of inspiration or insanity, and wandered solitary up and down the woods, like the gond in the jungle, the high priest had him bound with a sacred chain and maintained him in luxury for a year. At the end of the year, he was anointed with unguents and led forth to be sacrificed. A man whose business it was to slay human victims, and to whom practice had given dexterity, advanced from the crowd and thrust a sacred spear into the victim's side, piercing his heart. From the manner in which the slain man fell, omens were drawn as to the welfare of the commonwealth. Then the body was carried to a certain spot, where all the people stood upon it as a purificatory ceremony. This last circumstance clearly indicates that the sins of the people were transferred to the victim, just as the Jewish priest transferred the sins of the people to the scapegoat by laying his hands on the animal's head. And since the man was believed to be possessed by the divine spirit, we have here an undoubted example of a man-god slain to take away the sins and misfortunes of the people. In Tibet, the ceremony of the scapegoat presents some remarkable features. The Tibetan New Year begins with the new moon, which appears about the 15th of February. For 23 days afterwards, the government of Lhasa, the capital, is taken out of the hands of the ordinary rulers and entrusted to the monk of the Dabang Monastery, who offers to pay the highest sum for the privilege. The successful bidder is called the Jolno, and he announces his accession to power in person, going through the streets of Lhasa with a silver stick in his hand, monks from all the neighboring monasteries and temples assemble to pay him homage. The Jalno exercises his authority in the most arbitrary manner for his own benefit, as all the fines which he exacts are his by purchase. The profit he makes is about ten times the amount of the purchase money. His men go about the streets in order to discover any conduct on the part of the inhabitants that can be found fault with. 
every house in Lhasa is taxed at this time, and the slightest offense is punished with unsparing rigor by fines. This severity of the Jalna drives all working classes out of the city till the twenty-three days are over. But if the lady go out, the clergy come in. All the Buddhist monasteries of the country, for miles round about, open their gates and disgorge their inmates. All the roads that lead down into Lhasa from the neighboring mountains are full of monks hurrying to the capital, some on foot, some on horseback, some riding asses or lowing oxen, all carrying their prayer books and culinary utensils. In such multitudes do they come that the streets and squares of the city are encumbered with their swarms and incarnadined with their red cloaks. The disorder and confusion are indescribable. Bands of the holy men traverse the streets, chanting prayers or uttering wild cries. They meet, they jostle, they quarrel, they fight. Bloody noses, black eyes, and broken heads are freely given and received. All day long, too, from before the peep of dawn till after darkness has fallen, these red-cloaked monks hold services in the dim incense-laden air of the great Mashindranath temple. The cathedral of Lhasa, and thither they crowd thrice a day to receive their doles of tea and soup and money. The cathedral is a vast building standing in the center of the city and surrounded by bazaars and shops. The idols in it are richly inlaid with gold and precious stones. Twenty-four days after the Jalno has ceased to have authority, he assumes it again, and for ten days acts in the same arbitrary manner as before. On the first of the ten days, the priests again assemble at the cathedral, pray to the gods to prevent sickness and other evils among the people, and as a peace offering, sacrifice one man. The man is not killed purposely, but the ceremony he undergoes often proves fatal. Grain is thrown against his head, and his face is painted half white, half black. Thus grotesquely disguised, and carrying a coat of skin on his arm, he is called the King of the Years, and sits daily in the marketplace, where he helps himself to whatever he likes, and goes about shaking a black yak's tail over the people, who thus transfer their bad luck to him. On the tenth day, all the troops in Lhasa march to the great temple, and form in line before it. The King of the Years is brought forth from the temple, and receives small donations from the assembled multitude. He then ridicules the Jalno, saying to him, What we perceive through the five senses is no illusion, all you teach is untrue, and the like. The Jalno, who represents the Grand Lama for the time being, contests these heretical opinions. The dispute waxes warm, and at last both agree to decide the question at issue by a cast of the dice. The Jalno, offering to change places with the scapegoat, should the throw be against him. If the king of the years wins, much evil is prognosticated. But if the Jalno wins, there is great rejoicing, for it proves that his adversary has been accepted by the gods as a victim to bear all the sins of the people of Lhasa. Fortune, however, always favors the Jalno, who throws sixes with unvarying success, while his opponent turns up only ones. Nor is this so extraordinary as at first sight it might appear, for the Jalno's dice are marked with nothing but sixes, his adversaries with nothing but ones. When he sees the finger of Providence thus plainly pointed against him, the king of the years is terrified and flees away upon a white horse, with a white dog, a white bird, salt, and so forth, which have all been provided for him by the government. His face is still painted half white and half black, and he still wears his leathern coat. The whole populace pursues him, hooting, yelling, and firing blank shots and volleys after him. Thus, driven out of the city, he is detained for seven days in the great chamber of horrors at the Samyas Monastery, surrounded by monstrous and terrific images of devils, and skins of huge serpents and wild beasts. Thence he goes away into the mountains of Chetang, where he has to remain an outcast for several months or a year in a narrow den. If he dies before the time is out, the people say it is an auspicious omen, but if he survives, he may return to Lhasa and play the part of scapegoat over again the following year. This quaint ceremonial, still annually observed in the secluded capital of Buddhism, the Rome of Asia, is interesting because it exhibits, in a clearly marked religious stratification, a series of divine redeemers themselves redeemed of vicarious sacrifices, vicariously atoned for, of gods undergoing a process of fossilization, who, while they retain the privileges, have disburdened themselves of the pains and penalties of divinity. In the Jalno, we may without undue straining discern a successor of those temporary kings, those mortal gods who purchase a short lease of power and glory at the price of their lives. 
that he is the temporary substitute of the Grand Lama is certain, that he is, or was once, liable to act as scapegoat for the people is made nearly certain by his offer to change places with the real scapegoat, the King of the Years, if the arbitrament of the dice should go against him. It is true that the conditions under which the question is now put to the hazard have reduced the offer to an idle form, but such forms are no mere mushroom growths, springing up of themselves in a night. If they are now lifeless formalities, empty husks devoid of significance, we may be sure that they once had a life and a meaning. If at the present day they are blind alleys leading nowhere, we may be certain that in former days they were paths that led somewhere, if only to death." That death was the goal to which, of old, the Tibetan scapegoat passed after his brief period of license in the marketplace is a conjecture that has much to commend it. Analogy suggests it. The blank shots fired after him, the statement that the ceremony often proves fatal, the belief that his death is a happy omen, all confirm it. We need not wonder, then, that the Jalno, after paying so dear to act as deputy deity for a few weeks, should have preferred to die by deputy rather than in his own person when his time was up. The painful but necessary duty was accordingly laid on some poor devil, some social outcast, some wretch with whom the world had gone hard, who readily agreed to throw away his life at the end of a few days, if only he might have his fling in the meantime. For observe that while the time allowed to the original deputy, the Jalno, was measured by weeks, the time allowed to the deputy's deputy was cut down to days, ten days according to one authority, seven days according to another. So short a rope was doubtless thought a long enough tether for so black or sickly a sheep, so few sands in the hourglass, slipping so fast away, sufficed for one who had wasted so many precious years. Hence, in the jack pudding, who now masquerades with motley countenance in the marketplace of Lhasa, sweeping up misfortune with a black yak's tail, we may fairly see the substitute of a substitute, the vicar of a vicar, the proxy on whose back the heavy burden was laid when it had been lifted from nobler shoulders. But the clue, if we have followed it aright, does not stop at the Jalno. It leads straight back to the Pope of Lhasa himself, the Grand Lama, of whom the Jalno is merely the temporary vicar. The analogy of many customs in many lands points to the conclusion that, if this human divinity stoops to resign his ghostly power for a time into the hands of a substitute, it is, or rather was once, for no other reason than that the substitute might die in his stead. Thus, through the mist of ages, unillumined by the lamp of history, the tragic figure of the Pope of Buddhism, God's vicar on earth for Asia, looms dim and sad as the man-god who bore his people's sorrows, the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Subsection 4. On Scapegoats in General the foregoing survey of the custom of publicly expelling the accumulated evils of a village or town or country suggests a few general observations. In the first place, it will not be disputed that what I have called the immediate and the immediate expulsions of evil are identical in intention, in other words, that whether the evils are conceived of as invisible or as embodied in a material form is a circumstance entirely subordinate to the main object of the ceremony, which is simply to effect a total clearance of all the ills that have been infesting a people. If any link were wanting to connect the two kinds of expulsion, it would be furnished by such a practice as that of sending the evils away in a litter or a boat. For here, on the one hand, the evils are invisible and intangible, and, on the other hand, there is a visible and tangible vehicle to convey them away, and a scapegoat is nothing more than such a vehicle. In the second place, when a general clearance of evils is resorted to periodically, the interval between the celebrations of the ceremony is commonly a year, and the time of year when the ceremony takes place usually coincides with some well-marked change of season, such as the beginning or end of winter in the Arctic and temperate zones, and the beginning or end of the rainy season in the tropics. The increased mortality which such climatic changes are apt to produce, especially amongst ill-fed, ill-clothed, and ill-housed savages, is set down by primitive man to the agency of demons who must accordingly be expelled. Hence, in the tropical regions of New Britain and Peru, the devils are or were driven out at the beginning of the rainy season, 
hence on the dreary coasts of Baffin land, they are banished at the approach of the bitter Arctic winter. When a tribe has taken to husbandry, the time for the general expulsion of devils is naturally made to agree with one of the great epochs of the agricultural year, as sowing or harvest. But as these epochs themselves naturally coincide with changes of season, it does not follow that the transition from the hunting or pastoral to the agricultural life involves any alteration in the time of celebrating this great annual rite. Some of the agricultural communities of India and the Hindu Kush, as we have seen, hold their general clearance of demons at harvest, others at sowing time. But at whatever season of the year it is held, the general expulsion of devils commonly marks the beginning of the new year. For before entering on a new year, people are anxious to rid themselves of the troubles that have harassed them in the past. Hence, it comes about that in so many communities, the beginning of the new year is inaugurated with a solemn and public banishment of evil spirits. In the third place, it is said to be observed that this public and periodic expulsion of devils is commonly preceded or followed by a period of general license, during which the ordinary restraints of society are thrown aside, and all offenses, short of the gravest, are allowed to pass unpunished. In Guinea and Tonquin, the period of license precedes the public expulsion of demons, and the suspension of the ordinary government in Lhasa, previous to the expulsion of the scapegoat, is perhaps a relic of a similar period of universal license. Amongst the hosts of India, the period of license follows the expulsion of the devil. Amongst the Iroquois, it hardly appears whether it preceded or followed the banishment of evils. In any case, the extraordinary relaxation of all ordinary rules of conduct on such occasions is doubtless to be explained by the general clearance of evils which precedes or follows it. On the one hand, when a general riddance of evil and absolution from all sin is an immediate prospect, men are encouraged to give the rein to their passions, trusting that the coming ceremony will wipe out the score which they are running up so fast. On the other hand, when the ceremony has just taken place, men's minds are freed from the oppressive sense under which they generally labor of an atmosphere surcharged with devils, and in the first revulsion of joy they overleap the limits commonly imposed by custom and morality. When the ceremony takes place at harvest time, the elation of feeling which it excites is further stimulated by the state of physical well-being produced by an abundant supply of food. Fourthly, the employment of a divine man or animal as a scapegoat is especially to be noted. Indeed, we are here directly concerned with the custom of banishing evils only in so far as these evils are believed to be transferred to a god who was afterwards slain. It may be suspected that the custom of employing a divine man or animal as a public scapegoat is much more widely diffused than appears from the examples cited, for, as has already been pointed out, the custom of killing a god dates from so early a period of human history that in later ages, even when the custom continues to be practiced, it is liable to be misinterpreted. The divine character of the animal or man is forgotten, and he comes to be regarded merely as an ordinary victim. This is especially likely to be the case when it is a divine man who is killed. For when a nation becomes civilized, if it does not drop human sacrifices altogether, it at least selects as victims only such wretches as would be put to death at any rate. Thus, the killing of a god may sometimes come to be confounded with the execution of a criminal. If we ask why a dying god should be chosen to take upon himself and carry away the sins and sorrows of the people, it may be suggested that in the practice of using the divinity as a scapegoat, we have a combination of two customs which were at one time distinct and independent. On the one hand, we have seen that it has been customary to kill the human or animal god in order to save his divine life from being weakened by the inroads of age. On the other hand, we have seen that it has been customary to have a general expulsion of evils and sins once a year. Now, if it occurred to people to combine these two customs, the result would be the employment of the dying god as a scapegoat. He was killed not originally to take away sin, but to save the divine life from the degeneracy of old age. But since he had to be killed at any rate, people may have thought that they might as well seize the opportunity to lay upon him the burden of their sufferings and sins, in order that he might bear it away with him to the unknown world beyond the grave. The use of the divinity as a scapegoat clears up the ambiguity which, as we saw, appears to hang about the European folk custom of carrying out death. 
grounds have been shown for believing that in this ceremony, the so-called death was originally the spirit of vegetation who was annually slain in spring in order that he might come to life again with all the vigor of youth. But as I pointed out, there are certain features in the ceremony which are not explicable on this hypothesis alone. Such are the marks of joy with which the effigy of death is carried out to be buried or burnt, and the fear and abhorrence of it manifested by the bearers. But these features become at once intelligible if we suppose that the death was not merely the dying god of vegetation, but also a public scapegoat upon whom were laid all the evils that had afflicted the people during the past year. Joy on such an occasion is natural and appropriate, and if the dying god appears to be the object of that fear and abhorrence, which are properly due not to himself, but to the sins and misfortunes with which he is laden, this arises merely from the difficulty of distinguishing or at least of marking the distinction between the bearer and the burden. When the burden is of a baleful character, the bearer of it will be feared and shunned, just as much as if he were himself instinct with those dangerous properties of which, as it happens, he is only the vehicle. Similarly, we have seen that disease-laden and sin-laden boats are dreaded and shunned by East Indian peoples. Again, the view that in these popular customs the death is a scapegoat as well as a representative of the divine spirit of vegetation derives some support from the circumstances that its expulsion is always celebrated in spring and chiefly by Slavonic peoples. For the Slavonic year began in spring, and thus, in one of its aspects, the ceremony of carrying out death would be an example of the widespread custom of expelling the accumulated evils of the old year before entering on a new one. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. We will be back in two weeks with our next installment. In the meantime, you can catch up with our other pod, Midwest Covencast. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on our Patreon to gain access to additional content and exclusive coven merch. You can even join our coven by following us on social media at Midwest Coven Cast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. You can also keep up with us on our website, MidwestCovenCast.com. Until next time, coven, blessed be.